more deep, uh, deeply into memory, memory controllers and memory scheduling. It's another fascinating topic. And it'll, be, it'll become more important going into the future because memory is becoming more of a bottleneck. As you know, we're putting more cores on chip, different kinds of cores, applications that are more data intensive. And they need to go through this bottleneck to access memory. So we'll, we'll see some examples of why it's becoming more of a bottleneck today. Before that, you have a new homework due. Uh, this is actually due April 19th. It incorrectly said April 22nd is the due date. Uh, but there are reasons to do the homework anyway, uh, which, which is the exam, right? Your exam is coming up. And I would strongly recommend that you complete this before the exam to prepare for the exam. Because the topics that we cover are virtual memory cache interaction, main memory, memory scheduling. So doing the homework will help you. And again, the homeworks are mainly for your benefit and learning and preparation for the exam, I guess, in parentheses, uh, which tests your learning, presumably, right? They're not meant to be a large part of your grade. So if you miss a question here and there, it doesn't matter in the overall scheme of things, right? Okay, this is the homework for grade distribution. Looks like you guys did pretty well. <laughs> I guess it's hard to call this a distribution, but it is a distribution, yeah. <laughs> Labs are apparently harder, and I'll cover some of the feedback that we received from you. Uh, this is uh, true from the feedback too, but you'll have another lab, lab six, memory hierarchy lab. This is due April 22nd. We extend the deadline so you have extra days uh, after the exam. Uh, it's due Monday. So we actually swapped the de deadlines for the lab and the homework. That's what happened in the end. Uh, and you'll model uh, L2 cache and DRAM based main memory at the cycle level. So this should be exciting. Uh, a lot of the concepts we'll cover in the later part of the lecture today uh, will be part of your lab. Well, you know the caches, but DRAM-based main memory will cover some of the uh, scheduling algorithms today. And you'll have an extra credit, which is prefetching. You can design your own hardware prefetcher or read uh, in the literature to, Im uh, to improve system performance. So hopefully you'll enjoy doing that prefetching uh, extra credit too. And homework six and lab six are actually synergi synergistic, work on them together. Because homework six has questions on memory scheduling, which will hopefully help you with lab six also. Okay, this is the lab four grade distribution, which doesn't look like the homework four grade distribution, unfortunately. But looks like many of you are doing well with the labs. If you're around here, uh, figure out what's, what's gone wrong in the labs and talk with the TAs. Uh, they'd be happy to help you out. Okay, and there's extra credit also. Quite a few people attempted the extra credit and I'd like to recognize people who did well. This number seven is Albert Wang. I don't know if he's here, maybe not. Six is Eddie, Eddie is not here. There's a big difference between Albert and Eddie's cycle count. This is on Justin's test, prime test, right? It's a long test, so it takes 345 million cycles. Well, your simulations can be actually, a real workload, you can imagine it's much, much longer than uh, hundreds of millions of cycles, right? So you can now imagine the design trace-offs that you need to, you can, you can make uh, just by uh, executing some number of instructions. It's always a trade-off. That's why we go to high-level simulation. And I'll cover one of the comments that one of you made. You, you, you would prefer the labs to be very log, but there are good reasons to do high-level simulation also, to do architectural space exploration. Okay. I think the top five are actually uh, very close to each other. So if maybe, the, maybe in some other test they will be much clo uh, uh, the, the order would be reversed. But Andrew Pfeiffer, Andrew Mort, Martin Gao, Gon Charmini. How do you say your last name? Okay. Did I misspell it? Uh, no. no? Okay, good. <laughs> and Xiao Bo Zhao. They're all within, I guess, 1%. Is that within 1%? Maybe, maybe if we change the instructions a little bit, it would be, uh, the order would be a little bit different. I think it's mainly just initial values. Oh, is it? Do you think? Kind of Branch kind of predictors? Yeah. So effectively, they're all in a similar rank. Okay, yeah. But yeah, I'm glad that you guys did the extra credit, and here's your recognition. That's, you can say that you, did, you were in the top five in <laughs> lab four of uh, 447. Okay, but more importantly, and now you know how, uh, uh, how your mechanisms work, right? Okay, and midterm two next week, it's coming up. Hopefully you're ready. 
It's going to be similar format as midterm one. And again, suggestion, do homework six to prepare for the midterm. Should be fun. Last lecture, we covered enabling multiple axes in parallel, uh, very different ways of doing it. We talked about non-blocking caches, and we talked about how to do multiple axes in parallel uh, in the same cycle or in consecutive cycles, multi-porting, multiple copies, and banking. And we started main memory. Actually, we covered most of main memory. We talked about interleaving, which is a common concept on, in many memories, regardless of the technology, which is the same as banking. right? Uh, and uh, the, we cover the DRAM subsystem. It's five-dimensional in nature, both from bottom up and top down. So hopefully you have a good view, good understanding of the DRAM system. And we talked about address mapping. Today we'll uh, go into memory controllers with a focus on DRAM, but a lot of the concepts that we'll describe today are applicable to other technologies also. So we'll talk about them within the context of DRAM, but whenever you have uh, some kind of memory and it's long latency and you need to schedule operations to that memory, which is banked and which has multiple channels, which has some dimensional structure, you need to design a memory controller like this. Caches, for example, very large caches have memory controllers. I, uh, IBM Z uh, systems have caches that are on the order of 192 megabytes, I believe. They're L4 cache. And it's essentially memory for them. Uh, it's, a, it's an eDRAM cache, embedded DRAM cache. It's not commodity DRAM. But they need to design memory controllers that deal with these issues. If you have a large SRAM cache, that is, again, banked, and that uh, is accessed by many different threads, uh, or even a single thread that, that generates a lot of requests, you still need to arbitrate between those requests and somehow control memory. And you, 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 you encounter similar issues. So we'll talk about memory access scheduling, and we'll talk about memory interference. And you've already seen memory interference at the beginning of the lecture, right? I've shown you two programs, MATLAB and GCC, and one was denying service to the other. Uh, Today, if we get to it, we'll see solutions to it. OK. Uh, Wednesday, we all have a guest. We'll be honored with uh, Dr. William Strecker, who will be actually attending class. I'll try to get him to answer some questions from you. So this is to give you a heads up so that you can prepare questions. But who is he? He's the architect, principal architect of the VAX. VAX, you remember, right? We actually, you may have read the. VAX Architecture Handbook now that's written in 1977, 1978, which is on, linked from the class website. If you haven't, you can do that tonight. It's about 300 pages. I don't remember. <laughs> but it's fun. But he, he made a lot of the design decisions that went into that book, basically, that complicated CISC architecture. And there were reasons for it. And then he served as a, as a senior vice president of corporate strategy and technology and Chief Technology Officer at DECT, Digital Equipment Corporation. And he's actually a CME alum, which you guys will be. He did all of his degrees at Carnegie Mellon. And he received one of the prestigious awards from IEEE for being the principal designer of the VAX architecture for contributions of, to local area networks, high performance interconnects, caches, and memory hierarchies, everything you're learning in this course. Well, maybe we haven't covered the local area networks, but it's, it's one step up, right? The fundamentals you learn in this course, you can design local area networks relatively easily, or you will learn in the course. Uh, and you can read a story about him here. But rec a recommended reading that uh, he wrote, which I did not assign earlier because you have too many readings to begin with, but this is an enjoyable reading. It's a four-page uh, paper. Maybe it's six pages. I don't remember now. But this uh, 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 Gordon Bell, uh, which is another famous computer architect who designed early computers. He's the designer of the PDP-11, uh, actually, which was the precursor to VAX. So they've written a paper together saying, what, we, what have we learned from the PDP-11? We talked about PDP-11, right, this instruction format. It's two address machine. Uh, and what we have learned from VAX and Alpha. So this is a retrospective on their ISCA paper they published in 1974, I believe. And they've added, uh, they talk about some of the design decisions they made and why they made them in the architecture of these computers. So I would recommend this paper, and this will be linked from the website. It's not required. I think you will enjoy it. OK. So if you, have, um, if you have questions to ask, please feel free to prepare. <laughs> OK, a little bit on course feedback. This is w uh, very delayed, but we have taken into account your feedback. I'll, just, I'll briefly go over this with you. And we'll ask for some more feedback, because I think this is good to calibrate. Uh, some feedback is contradictory, so we cannot take into account everything. But only 10 of you responded. So the next time we ask, I'm hoping that uh, more of you will respond. 
10 out of 30 is only one third, right? That's a low participation rate. So course pace, a lot of people think it's fast, but okay, appropriate, necessary. Uh, some people say fast, but this pushes me to work more efficiently, so that's, that's great. Uh, and I guess a lot of people are positive, or the negative people did not respond. And the material is intuitive after some explanation, as it should be, actually. The material really should be intuitive after some explanation. Uh, if something is not intuitive, it's very likely that it's not going to be implemented. Because in the end, it's a human designer who is implementing this, and if they don't understand it, they're not going to implement it. Very likely. If something is not simple, again, it's, not, it's very likely that it's not going to be implemented. That's, that's the nature of the design. OK, uh, lectures. A lot of good thoughts, useful, informative, helpful, thorough, interesting. Great. I like this great part. <laughs> That's six people. Long or too long, and I agree with this. And I don't know exactly how to fix this problem. We'll have to fix it next semester. Uh, but I think we're trying to alleviate this with uh, the videos, the presence of the videos. That said, I'll try to cut it short today. But whenever I say that, it becomes longer. Right? <laughs> There's this <laughs> Murphy's Law, I guess, uh, that's in effect. <laughs> Pace of lectures, uh, a lot of people think it's either fast or good, fine, OK. So uh, I assume there is no problem here, at least for, from those who, uh, did not, uh, who did respond. Slow but good. So some of you find it slow. Maybe I should go faster. <laughs> OK. Slides and notes are very helpful. Sometimes there is a repetition. Yes, uh, I'll try to cut the repetition, but that's good for learning also. OK. Homework's interesting and long. OK, fair. Pretty long and add more to work. Uh, Balances the, with the difficulty of the labs. Too many homeworks. Questions are sometimes vague. And we have addressed this feedback. We're trying to make the questions a lot less vague. Early on, some of the questions were actually vague for purpose so that you can think about it. But uh, this is good feedback, I think. Hopefully, we're addressing it. Mm. Again, it's true that we have many homeworks. And again, uh, the purpose of the homeworks is not to grade you. The, the main purpose, uh, I believe it's just 10% of your grade. The main purpose is for your learning and preparation for everything else. So in fact, you may have realized, I've said this before, a lot of the homework questions are taken from past exams right now. You can find the solutions online. So if the goal is to get the grade, you can just copy and paste the solutions, and we won't penalize you at all. <laughs> but that's not, that's not the purpose of the homeworks, basically. OK? <laughs> Labs, uh, one person thought they were great, <laughs> with the exclamation point. <laughs> Uh, fun, good, fair, tedious, but interesting. Actually, two people thought that way. Long, uh, somebody thought it was grading was harsh. Well, Justin normally is not a harsh guy, but <laughs> but this is where this is where you actually need to get it right, right? In the end, you're going to design computers, and if you don't get it right, there's a problem. And somebody thought lab one sucked. There was no way of verifying the solution, and we'll try to address that <laughs> in the next incarnation. I don't know how to address this in this incarnation. Uh, OK. Second lab seems unstructured. Lab 2 seemed poorly documented. And I think I agree with this. We'll try to fix this next semester. Feels good once done. No kidding, right? <laughs> oh, there you go. Challenging, often repetitive, but definitely help understanding. Looks like I did some out of order execution here. Satisfaction with material. This was, I guess, uh, right level. Most of you thought that way. Interesting and new. Give more microprocessor examples. I try to. Overwhelming lectures. And I guess you can go back to the lectures in YouTube, but I'll try to address that. Materials as expected, yes, five, yes, one. Uh, yes and more, yes, yes, yes and no, kind of heavy on the theory. Uh, it is true that I do a lot of theory in class, which is the uh, trade-offs, uh, right? Uh, advantages and disadvantages. But in the end, those are the fundamentals. That's what you will get back to, not necessarily the implementation or much on the evaluation. I mean, it's good to have a good idea of what uh, gives you a good performance and what it doesn't give you a good performance. But it's really the fundamental way of thinking about, for example, what's the benefit of uh, a stream prefetcher that will enable you to design new computers because your applications will determine the performance improvement. If you can think about things fundamentally, then you can make the right design decisions. That's why the theory part is, theory part may feel heavy. Less fun than expected. Well, hopefully, we're making it more fun. Uh, what have you left? Uh, tell us about uh, why it's less fun, so we'll try to address that. Uh, workload just right. 
till now at least as one of you. <laughs> I don't know if it's become worse, but we'll give you another feedback sheet to see <laughs> how this has changed. As much as expected, I guess it's a good political answer, right? <laughs> I don't know how much you expected. <laughs> Hopefully a lot. <laughs> Slightly heavy, heavy, too heavy. Uh, so this is the mixed, this is a mixed uh, question. Uh, I guess this is the uh, question that has the most mixed answers because some of you think just right, many of you think heavy. Hard to keep up readings. Uh, okay. Well, this, this was a fun comment that I read actually. Uh, that, that may be true, actually. I might agree with this. Lab 2 bonus felt a, little, a bit like a sick joke because it was a heavy bonus. But one of you actually did it and got it right, got full credit out of it. <laughs> so I'll let you guys fight with each other to figure out if it's a sick joke or a great thing. <laughs> but I think I understand that not everybody has the same con constraints in terms of time. So That's why it's a bonus. <laughs> OK. Uh, what would you change? This is actually uh, some of the most important uh, answers. Shorter lectures, longer breaks, shorter but more lectures. These were all suggestions. Uh, and I'll try to address this. Uh, and you know I'll be bad at ad addressing it also. So I apologize if I do not address this well. Shorter homeworks, again, the purpose of homeworks is not grading. So feel free to not do the <laughs> questions. Oh, I have out of order execution here also. More documentation on lab starter code, shorter explanations on board. Uh, should I keep the board interaction less? Should I do, uh, because I go to board to explain some context in, de in detail, and one of the comments was we should keep that shorter. Any thoughts? No? Okay, board is better. Who thinks board is better? Oh, that's actually quite a few. Who thinks board is not good? Don't be shy. Okay, maybe you're not here. <laughs> or, okay, tell us how much the average median time spent on each lab is. Well, I don't know how to get that. I guess we could ask you. It's how uh, uh, does it. Um, oh, that's right, yeah. Asks every Friday, uh -huh. how much did you spend on the okay. this week? And, and uh, he, he, he takes a vote? Or uh, he, well, he actually gives recitation quizzes every Friday. Oh, I see, okay. But, um, so you want more quizzes too? <laughs> or any, somebody wants more quizzes? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> sure, I understand. So we can, we can actually poll you to, to get that answer. And assuming you, can, you have a good assessment of the time, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a good representative uh, thing. Maybe we'll try. System error log, yeah, I agree with that. We, we need to get our infrastructure up for next time. Checkpoint the, uh, in the middle for long complex labs, and we do have this for the longer labs, I believe. Maybe not all of them. Uh, what about doing labs as continued evolution of a MIPS processor in Verilog? I think that's a good idea, but uh, uh, that will give you a lot of depth in Verilog, but not necessarily breadth in computer architecture. So a lot of the computer architecture is not necessarily Verilog. Whenever you design a processor, you need to make high-level design choices, uh, which you will be making with the memory scheduling and the prefetcher, for example. That's, I'll say that that's impossible to do in Verilog, because you've already designed your processor if you're going uh, to, and you cannot make those design choices in that kind of low-level simulation. And part of the purpose of this class is to educate you such that you can be the architects of future systems and make the high-level design choices as well as the low-level implementation. Stagger due dates of assignments. Yeah, so we don't frantically move between them. Well, you weren't expecting to move frantically in this class. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll try to do that, but this is a hard problem. This is a hard problem, especially with unpredictable uh, especially with other constraints and schedule. Limited group discussions on concepts. We'll try to have more recitations, I think. That would be good. So we'll try to address your feedback. And some of them we'll not be able to address, unfortunately, like the mid processor and Verilog. But I think that's a good idea. Maybe we could add that as another lab assignment, right? You won't like that. OK. Other comments. Materials on course website are good. Actually, this was uh, from many of you. It'd be nice if there was more feedback about how my previous designs could be improved so they do not affect, negatively affect future designs. And I agree with that. If you would like this, definitely go to the TAs. It's very uh, hard to give this one-on-one uh, 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 one -on -one feedback without request. So definitely go to the TAs and work with the TAs, and they'd be happy to work with you. That's why we have the uh, lab sessions and office hours. Lectures are leading the labs by two, three weeks. Uh, that was true early on, I think. I think it's going to be less true right now. Overall, I am enjoying this course and feel that I'm learning a lot. I hope 
everybody feels that way. There's just a lot of work, but I feel that's the only way to learn and completely understand the material. And I think I agree with that. <laughs> that's, that's the way I understand the material. The TAs are awesome, so hopefully <laughs> you guys make use of them more if, if you think they're awesome. <laughs> okay, and they're awesome, I think. Uh, if, if it weren't for them, we, we couldn't have this course, I think. Okay, any questions, any more feedback? Cover this relatively quickly. But now let's get to the material. Uh, we stopped here. We were going to talk about DRAM refresh. Uh, this is a unique property of DRAM. It's dynamic memory, and we need to refresh it, right? Why? Because this capacitor uh, charge leaks over time. And this is going to become a bigger problem. And the memory controller needs to uh, refresh each row periodically to restore the charge. What does that mean? It needs to read and close each row of every n milliseconds. What is a read and close? Activate and pre-charge. That's basically it. Uh, typical n is every 64 milliseconds. So this is a lot of overhead, right? There are a lot of downsides to this. First of all, energy consumption. Each refresh consumes energy. You're doing an activate and pre-charge, and you're doing this on every row in memory. Now you can calculate how many rows you have in memory. 32 gigabyte memory system, uh, 8 kilobyte rows. How many rows do you have? 32 gigabytes is 2 to the 35. 8 kilobytes is 2 to the 13. 2 to the 35 divided by 2 to the 13 is 2 to the 22. So that's 4 million rows, if, unless I uh, made a mistake here. 4 million rows refreshed once every uh, 64 milliseconds. That's a lot, a lot of energy, a lot of waste. Uh, so we, ideally, we don't want to do it. And per, this leads to performance degradation also. When you're refreshing a DRAM row, uh, the rank or bank is unavailable, which means that there is, there is a memory request to that bank. It cannot proceed, right? It also leads to some quality of service impact because you can have long pause times, right? Every 64 milliseconds, you're going, to, you're going to do this refresh. What if your program needs this critical request to be serviced in that bank? Well, too bad. You're refreshing memory. And this, it turns out, refresh rate limits DRAM capacity scaling. As you increase DRAM capacity, this becomes a much bigger problem. I'll show you some data related to this. So this is going to be a much, much bigger problem going into the future. And this is already a problem in, your, uh, in systems like this, right? Uh, this, every, every joule of energy you spend is critical in these systems. And this is just a waste. OK, well, it's not a waste if you look at it in one way, right? It's needed for data integrity. <laughs> It's actually not a waste at all, but you don't want to do it. So what is the effect on performance? Uh, the ERAM bank is unavailable while it's refreshed. This leads to long pause times also. If we refresh all rows in burst, every 64 milliseconds, the DRAM will be unavailable until refresh ends. And you can make the calculations how long that burst is, right? So people have developed uh, methods with burst refresh, uh, which is relatively not used today. Uh, all rows are refreshed immediately one after another. And I'll, give you, I'll show you a picture. This is usually not a good idea if you care about these long pause times. So today, most systems use distributed refresh. Each row is refreshed at a different time. So refreshes are staggered. This is like the assignments, labs and homeworks do at the same time. Well, stagger them so that you, have, <laughs> you don't have this quality of service impact, right? This works if you have enough time, of course. Uh, so this is the difference, uh, basically. This is your burst refresh. All rows are refreshed every 64 milliseconds. So you have uh, a huge uh, time during which all rows are refreshed. And then you have a lot of time where uh, the memory is available. And then later, after 64 milliseconds, you need to refresh all rows again. Distributed refresh, you distribute the refreshes of each row and stagger them. That's the idea. And this is done in most systems. It eliminates long pause times. And this should be obvious. There, uh, uh, but the question, uh, but this, this still doesn't eliminate refreshes, right? This doesn't eliminate uh, the performance impact or energy impact at all. Energy is still there. Right? So how else can we reduce the effect of refresh on performance? Does distributed refresh reduce imp refresh impact on energy? It doesn't, actually. I told you that. Can we reduce the number of refreshes? That's going forward, this will be a big question. And I'll tell you about some of the work uh, some of my students have done uh, to reduce the impact of refreshes going forward. And hopefully, this will give you an idea of what can you do uh, in, the, in the future. Because DRAM has not been studied a lot, uh, looking into the future is very important in memory. Uh, and this is basically the extent of what has been done in DRAM refresh uh, today. 
What is refresh today? Today what happens is you have a, ref a command called auto refresh. Uh, basically, the DRAM controller sends uh, to uh, uh, DRAM a command saying auto refresh, and the DRAM itself automatically refreshes a batch of rows. So that's one way of doing refresh. There's another way of doing refresh. You can activate and precharge on every row in the DRAM controller. In that case, the DRAM controller needs to keep track of the rows and their refreshes. So what is the overhead of this on performance? So if you look at the device capacity, this is from uh, Jamie's Raider paper uh, published at ISCA last year. Uh, as you increase the device capacity, this is the capacity of a DRAM chip. Today, uh, the biggest DRAM chip that you can get is 8 gigabits. Going into the future, we would like to increase the capacity, right? Moore's law enables more transistors. Uh, X-axis capacity, Y-axis is the percentage of time the chip spends refreshing, needs to spend refreshing at 64 milliseconds. Uh, today, about 8% or 10% of the time is spent refreshing, which is still high. And going into the future, it grows exponentially. 46% of the time, half of the time will be spent refreshing. And this is the overhead in terms of energy. This is percentage of DRAM energy spent refreshing and the capacity. Today, it's about 15%. And going into the future, it'll be about 40, 50%, right? which is pretty high. You don't want to design a chip that's large, that provides you large capacity, but it's unavailable half of the time. And half of the energy it uses is wasted, used for no reason. So how can you uh, reduce the rate of refresh? I'll give you some ideas related to this. Uh, there's a problem with conventional refresh. Every row is refreshed at the same rate today, every 64 milliseconds. But if you look at a DRAM chip, most row rows can be refreshed much less often without losing data. Can anybody guess why? So I'll, I'll give you this. If you increase the refresh interval, this is the 64 milliseconds cutoff. Uh, the, on the x-axis, I show you the refresh interval. And what happens? How many uh, failures you get, uh, wrong data you get as you increase the refresh interval? So if you make the refresh interval 256 milliseconds, you get about 1,000 failures, 1,000 incorrect cells. If you make the refresh interval 100 seconds, you still, you don't get a whole lot. Maybe you get uh, 10 to the 9 cells, which is a lot actually. But still, most of the DRAM cells uh, can retain data tens of seconds if you look at this. There are only very few that cannot retain data uh, more than two, uh, 256 milliseconds and none that cannot retain data, uh, uh, I guess, less than 64 milliseconds. Can anybody guess why you have this variability in terms of data retention? So you have this array of cells. Some of them can retain data longer. Some of them cannot retain data, data longer. I guess if you look at this, this is what it looks like, right? This is your bit line. And these are your word lines also. And you can replicate this, right? You have these word lines also. I'll just draw a two by two cell. And imagine you have many, many of these. And some of them tend to be much more leaky than the others. No thoughts? Yes? Actually, no. <laughs> There's no relationship with the program here. Yes? That's right, exactly. Variations in the manufacturing. These capacitors and transistors cannot be made perfectly the same. So you have variations. If it's a little bit small, it can retain less data. Right? It can retain charge for a shorter time. Similarly with the transistors. And there's this huge variation which we cannot control that leads to this kind of distribution. So we know that most drops can be refreshed much, much less often without losing data. But today, there is no support in DRAM for dif different refresh rates per row. So if we can somehow provide the support, maybe we can design a much better DRAM system going into the future. So we'll take a look at one example of how to do that. Basically, this is the observation. Only very few rows need to be refreshed at the same worst case rate. That's the worst case rate, 64 milliseconds. Only 1,000 rows need to be refreshed uh, every 256 milliseconds. It says cells here, but it turns out uh, these cells uh, that have different retention times are randomly distributed. There's no pattern to it because it's, again, affected by the process variations. Uh, 
So can we exploit this to reduce refresh op uh, operations at low cost? Maybe you guys can guess what the mechanism will be. Well, obviously you can say, uh, you can determine the refresh rate each row needs and store it somewhere and tell it to the memory controller. And memory controller refreshes every row at the rate it needs to be refreshed, right? If a row can retain data for one second, there's no point in refreshing it every 64 milliseconds. So identify that uh, min uh, minimum retention time, identify the minimum retention time of each row and do the right thing for each row. And that's the idea, basically. I already saw, uh, told you this. The problem is, again, the problem is we have millions of rows, right? First of all, if you identify the retention time, you need to store that retention time somewhere. And that's actually a lot of overhead. If you have four million rows, for example, and you identify retention times, it's already megabytes and megabytes of data. So you don't want to do that. So a more cost-conscious idea is you can bin the rows according to their minimum retention times. So basically quantize the retention time and refresh the rows in each bin at the refresh rate specified for the bin. So these rows are rows that have retention times that are less than 256 milliseconds. And there are only a thousand of them. So bin them, group them together. And these rows that have, are, uh, are rows that have retention time that are less than 128 milliseconds, another bin. And another bin for everything else, right? Now you reduce the cost a lot, right? You don't need to keep track of a lot of these rows. That's the idea. Only very few rows need to be refreshed very frequently, which means that you can have only a few bins. If you look at this graph, only very few rows need to be refreshed every 256 milliseconds. You could even have a single bin, perhaps, right? That says these are the rows that need to be refreshed every 256 milliseconds, or more frequently than 256 milliseconds, and everything else uh, at 256 milliseconds. That's the idea. Uh, so this leads to low hardware overhead to achieve large reductions in refresh operations. Uh, and this is described in this paper. I have not assigned it, but I'll give you some of the ideas. If you're interested in this, go ahead, go ahead and read it. Uh, the mechanism uh, now boils down to, first, you need to figure out the retention time of all DRAM rows. This is called profiling. It could potentially be done at DRAM design time or dynamically. It turns out this is a tough problem also. And I will not get into this, but uh, if you're interested in this, you can read more about it. The second is binning. I'll focus on this because there are some fundamental concepts here. How do you store the rows into bins by retention time? Right? Again, we still have 4 million rows. How are we going to represent those rows? in hardware or in software without a lot of overhead. We're going to use something called bloom filters for efficient and scalable storage. Do you guys know about bloom filters? No? OK, this will be fun then. This is a very fundamental concept. It's a, it's a data structure that enables you to approximately represent set membership. And it will be very intuitive, hopefully. OK, so if you look at DRAM, this is your DRAM. And this is your retention time bins, right? Somehow you need to store uh, the addresses of those rows that have retention time within this bin, the addresses of these rows that have retention time that need to be refreshed every 128 milliseconds, and the, all of those rows that need to be refreshed every 256 milliseconds. So we'll try to have three bins. So how do you store that? And I'll uh, show you the uh, mechanism. But it turns out you can do the storage with only 1.25 kilobyte uh, for a 32 gigabyte DRAM memory. So basically, we'll store the addresses of 2 to the 22 rows in 1.25 kilobytes, but approximately. And we'll, uh, then the memory controller needs to refresh. So if you, once you've binned the rows in these bloom filters, memory controller refreshes rows in different bins at different rates. Basically, it needs to, it, uh, it needs to probe. Is that mine? OK. No. That's. There is, a, there is a psychological effect with all of these phones now, right? You always think it's your phone that's ringing. Um, so uh, the memory control will probe the bloom filters to determine the refresh rate of a row. So actually, this is one mechanism. And other mechanisms, once you have this information, you could use these bins to actually uh, not, uh, expose these bins to the operating system such that the operating system doesn't allocate data on those rows, right? Assuming your operating system knows the structure of the DRAM. And we discussed that earlier right, in, in the last lecture. So I'll give you one mechanism where memory controller does this refreshing. But uh, think about other ways in which uh, you can use this information. And you'll be the designers of future memories. So 
it's good for you to understand the implications of these. So how do you do profiling? Again, this is an open problem, but one way of doing pr profiling is uh, for each row, you write some data into the row. You prevent it from being refreshed for some amount of time. And you measure the time before the data corruption. So here, uh, we initially write all ones to all of the rows. After 64 milliseconds, we, uh, we, we prevent it from uh, being refreshed uh, and read the data after 128 milliseconds. And if there is an error, in this case, there is an error, row one's retention time is less than 128 milliseconds. Right? You can figure that out. And you could keep doing this for all the rows in the system and figure out a retention time bin for each row. Make sense? It turns out it's not that simple. It turns out uh, the data you store in the row and the data you store around the rows affect your retention time because of coupling effects. There's interference that goes on in these word lines and bit lines. And uh, so you need to find the worst case data pattern. And this, uh, this is a tough problem. But doable you could, by being uh, conservative. OK, the second is binning. How do you actually bin? Uh, how do you efficiently and scalably store rows into retention time bins? Uh, and we'll use hardware bloom filters. But before that, what, what else can you do? Let's say you have only a thousand of these rows whose addresses you know, uh, and you want to, actually, I've, I've given you an example, right? Uh, only about 30 rows uh, need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. So you have this bin. Let's call this bin one. So you need to store only 30 row addresses in this bin. And in the second bin, you have about 1,000 row addresses. These need to be refreshed every 128 milliseconds. Let's call this bin 2. So you could actually say that I'm going to store this in a table, right? Why not design a table? Uh, bin 1 is a CAM, content addressable memory. It contains the addresses of 30 rows. And bin 2 is a bigger cam, I guess cam 2. It contains the address of 1,000 rows. And when the system starts up, it reads this from the DRAM and populates this, these uh, rows, uh, it populates these cams. And whenever the memory controller needs to issue a refresh, it basically compares the address, I guess row address, to be refreshed. to these cams. And if there is a match with this row address to be refreshed and any of the cams, then you know that uh, this, if there's a match here, then you know that the row needs to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. And if there's a match here, then you know that the row needs to be refreshed every 128 milliseconds. If otherwise, if there's no match here, the row needs to be refreshed every 256 milliseconds. Right. Make sense? So what is the downside of this? You could do these tables, right? It's not that expensive. It's about only a thousand entry cam comparison. Well, it could be a little bit energy inefficient, right? So that's one downside. It may, it may not be efficient to do this comparison this way. The second downside is what if you add more DRAM into your system, right? You'll get more rows. And the DRAM tells you, oh, I have another row for you. You've added me into the system. I have another 1,000 rows that you need to store, by the way, in this DIM. Well, too bad. I have only 1,000 entry cam. What am I going to do, right? It, so it's not a scalable solution. Having these tables is not a scalable solution. And that's another benefit of the Bloom filters. So what we're really trying to do here is we're trying to store a set of rows. And we're going to test the membership of those rows, uh, in, uh, of other rows in that set. That's what the memory controller will do. We have a set of rows that have retention times that are less than 64 milliseconds, another set of rows that are less than 128 milliseconds. And we'd like to give an address uh, to some structure, and we'd like that structure to tell us, is that structure present or absent? That's exactly what a Bloom filter does. Uh, well, let me go. This was invented by Burton Bloom, and this is a nice paper. It's a theoretical paper that was written in Communications of the ACM in 1970. But this is basically a probabilistic data structure that compactly represents set membership, presence or absence of element in a set. So that gets rid of the CAMs. Uh, so one way of representing set membership is for every row in the system, let's say, have a bit, right? 
one bit per row, right? Or per address, row address, let's say. Is this row present in this bin or absent in this bin? Zero indicates absent, one indicates present. So for uh, bin one here, you'll have about 30 rows whose bit is set, right? So you have 2 to the 22 bits, if you remember my calculation, and only 30 of them are set. So this represents a set membership. Now you can give the row address, which indexes into this, and you can get a 1 or 0, right? It's a bit vector. It may not be as efficient as this one, but it's scalable, right? Because you have it for every row in this. Well, maybe it's not that scalable. Because as you add more DRAM, you need this also. So this is a problem. So this is a very inefficient way of representing set membership, but it's a very exact way, right? You can exactly know whether a row is present or absent in this bin. So a hardware bloom filter, or a bloom filter in general, uh, so this is a non-approximate way of uh, doing the set membership. Use one bit per element to indicate absence or presence of each element from an element space of n elements. If your address space, I guess you can have, uh, if your address is n bits, you can have two of the n elements here. So you need two of the n bits. But the idea of a bloom filter is to be approximate. Use a much smaller number of bits and indicate each element's presence or absence with a subset of these bits. So how do you do that? Basically, some elements map to the bits uh, that are also mapped to the other elements. So instead of having this huge thing, we're going to condense it. We're going to have a smaller bit vector, maybe 100 entries. Now when you get a row address whose membership you're going to test, you take some bits from the address and index and see if that bit is set or not set. If the bit is set, the bloom filter is going to tell you, yes, this address is present. If the bit is not set, the bloom filter tells you the address is absent. Now the problem is because this doesn't have 2 to the n bits, this only has 100 bits, there may be some addresses that have that map to the same entry, right? So even though you think this row address is present in the bloom filter, maybe it really should not have been, right? So that's why this is an approximate data structure. Some, uh, some addresses map to the same bits. So that's the idea of a balloon filter. And there are three operations. We're go, uh, insertion of a row that adds elements uh, to the set to indicate their membership. And testing, you, you test uh, whether or not uh, an, uh, an element is present. And you can also remove all elements. So let's take a look at some of these uh, examples. So, Actually, uh, any questions on this for now? The idea is clear? OK. So one issue is if you actually take, one, uh, let's say uh, you have here 128 elements, right? Which means that you need to take seven bits from the address to index into this. If you have only one bit to index into this, the probability of another address mapping to the same bit is high, right? because you just take seven addresses, uh, seven bits from the address. So many systems, they use hashing functions, hash functions, to randomize the index into the bloom filter. Basically, this address, you take some bits of the address, go through a hash function, and that maps to some bits in the bit vector. And the hope is that that bit is randomized with the address, so that you don't get these collisions in the balloon filter. The idea, if, if two addresses map to the same bit, then that's a collision. Or we could call this aliasing also, right? So that's one way of reducing the collisions. Another way of reducing the collision is not to use only one bit to represent the membership of an address, but use multiple bits. So to indicate the presence or absence of an address, you go through multiple hash functions. Maybe you take some bits, go through hash function one. This maps uh, the address to one of the bits in the bit vector. 
And maybe you take some other bits, go through hash function 2, and this maps the address to some other bit here. And if both of those bits are present, then that indicates the presence of the address in the bit vector. Now you can test. Uh, now it may be that when you test this other address, it goes to the same hash function to figure out uh, whether it's present. And this hash function maps it to the same bit. So you get a 1 here. But this, when this address is taken through this hash function, the hash function indicates some other location, not this one. So uh, you get 1 and 0, which means that this address is not present in the Bloom filter. So you reduce the aliasing by representing an address with multiple bits in the Bloom filter. Instead of having only one bit represent an address as membership. And you can do that. Uh, a lot of systems do that. I'll give you an example of uh, how this operates. Let's say you have uh, a bit vector here uh, to insert, and you have three hash functions. Basically, uh, each address's membership is represented uh, after mapping that address with these three hash functions to bits. So if you want to insert row 1 into the Bloom filter, row 1's address goes through these hashing functions. And in this case, they happen to map to these bits. And you set those bits in, that hash, uh, in the bit vector. Now row 1 is inserted into this Bloom filter. Let's, let's, uh, now let's say we want to test the presence of row 1. What do you do? You go through the same three hash functions. Take the address, go through hash function 1. It maps to a bit that's set. Take the address, go through hash function 2, it maps to a bit that's set. Take the address, go through hash function 3, it maps to a bit that's set. Since all of the bits are already set because we had inserted the row, we get a 1. The Bloom filter tells us this address exists. Right. Let's insert, uh, let's, let's check the presence of row 2. Is row 2 present? Basically, you take the address, go through all three hash functions. Each hash function maps the address to different bits. And it turns out row 2 is not present because the bits that uh, the hash functions map to are not all set. One of them is set because we had inserted row 1. But the other two, uh, two bits that row 2's address maps to are not set, which means that row 2 is not present. So Bloom filter gave us the correct answer in this case. Now let's insert row 4. We go through these three hash functions again. And it so happens that these three hash functions uh, map to three different bits, and they're all set because we're inserting row 4. Now row 4 is in the Bloom filter. Now let's test this row 5 is present. We never inserted row 5, right? We inserted row 1, row 4, and we're going to check the presence of row 5. We go through these hash functions with the address, and it so happens that row 5 maps to three bits that are set because of the insertion of rows 1 and 4. Well. We never insert row 5, but the Bloom filter tells us I have row 5 in my cell. Well, that's the approximate part of the Bloom filter. Right? This, is, this is called a false positive. Even though we've never inserted the address, it's there. Is this, is this OK? Well, in this particular application, it's OK, right? Uh, because remember that, well, uh, let me get back to this. False positive is a row may be declared present in the Bloom filter even if it was never inserted. In this case, it's, not a, it's OK because we can, we'll refresh some rows more frequently than needed. Because remember, we have, well, now the cams will not be cams, but you have a Bloom filter 1 and Bloom filter 2. When we want to refresh a row, we want to check, should we refresh every 64 milliseconds, every 128 milliseconds, or every 256 milliseconds? If we hit in this Bloom filter because of a false positive, we'll refresh it more frequently than needed, right. which is OK. You'll just lose some benefit from uh, energy savings. The more important property of a Bloom filter is you get no false negatives. And that's what we want in this case. Rows are never refreshed less frequently than needed. Right? You're always overly estimating the set membership with a Bloom filter. And it's scalable. It never overflows. Right? You can keep inserting things. Eventually, all of the bits will be set. But you can always check for membership. It won't, it won't always tell you the right answer. It'll give you false positives if you keep inserting stuff into the Bloom filter. Yes? So basically, the hash function will decide how often you get a false positive. Exactly. 
there are two things that decide how uh, often you uh, get false positives. Uh, first of all, hash functions. Well, I guess three things. The size of the Bloom filter and how many things have you have inserted uh, into the Bloom filter. And you can read many papers. Bloom Bloom's paper uh, has analysis. And people have used uh, Bloom filters in many, many different applications, in software as well as hardware. It's a general data structure. Uh, so people have developed these hash functions that try to randomize more. And you can get equations. So you can easily find equations uh, to figure out what kind of hash function you should use to get this false positive rate. But your application needs to be able to tolerate false positives, right? Uh, if you're actually, uh, if, you, if you're checking something really critical, then this won't work. OK. And this is efficient. Now you don't need to store information on a per row basis or per element basis. Uh, this leads to simple hardware as well as simple software. In this case, uh, you can use only two filters for 1.25 kilobytes uh, for a 32 gigabyte DRAM system. Okay. And you can imagine, you can do the calculation of the size of the cams, which, is, which will be greater than uh, 1.25 kilobytes. And more importantly, it won't be scalable. Although, it will not have uh, false positives. But that's okay, our application can tolerate it. So that's a fundamental data structure that you might uh, use in the future. So this is useful when you can tolerate false positives. And you can read the following papers. Actually, these two papers have uh, very good descriptions. Uh, the evicted address filter uh, by one of my other students has a very good description of the operation of a hardware bloom filter. And I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Okay. Now that we've stored these rows in the Bloom filters, what can you do? You can, uh, we can now, uh, the memory controller can now choose a refresh candidate row every 64 milliseconds and determine which bin the row is in. And depending on which Bloom filter gives a hit, it can decide whether or not to refresh the row. Right. That's the idea. And this is the mechanism. You can read that. So how can you implement this? Uh, well, one option is, this is the baseline design that we have today. You have the memory controller and DRAM, and there's some control logic in DRAM that controls the banks, right? Today's refresh control is in, uh, in the DRAM's control logic, in order refresh. The memory controller does not even know which row it's refreshing in today's systems. Now, it doesn't used to be that way. In, in old DDR systems, uh, DDR stands for double data rate, which we don't need to go into. But in old DDR systems, memory controller was responsible for refreshing. Today, you can do auto refresh. And this mechanism can be implemented in either the controller or DRAM. And this is, it's always a good idea to understand the trade offs of where you should implement uh, an idea. Let's take a look at if it's implemented in the controller. If it's implemented in the controller, you need to have the Bloom filters in the controller. And somehow, somebody needs to communicate to the controller what to store in the Bloom filter. Right? Or the controller needs to figure it out automatically. Now, imagine how you would do that, right? If the DRAM manufacturer, if the DIM manufacturer actually stored this information somewhere on the DIM and told the memory controller, oh, these are the rows that are actually, uh, that need refresh every 64 milliseconds, and these are the other rows that need refresh every 128 milliseconds, at system boot up, this needs to be communicated somehow. So that changes the interface. Whereas memory controller can somehow dynamically identify these also. But think about how ca that can be done. That's a tough problem. Or, uh, well, we can read the overhead here. Or you could have uh, the mechanism in DRAM itself, and you have the Bloom filters here. Now there is no communication that needs to be done between the memory controller and DRAM. The memory controller still says auto refresh, and DRAM uh, now can uh, internally do the refresh. But now think about when the uh, DRAM will be available or unavailable. Now, depending on how many refreshes are needed based on these Bloom filters, DRAM may be um, unavailable uh, for a long time or available for a short uh, right away. Right? Because maybe the D memory controller says auto refresh and the DRAM doesn't have anything to refresh. Right? So think about that as well. So that changes the interface also. Because now, uh, before, memory controller used to say auto refresh and DRAM used to refresh a batch of rows. And that batch was a predictable number. If you do this, that batch may not be a predictable number, right? Because you're not doing refreshes that much. OK. So hopefully you have a good understanding of what the upsides and downsides would be if you implement something like, D, something like this in DRAM versus the memory controller. 
Another place where you could implement something like this is, is the operating system, as I said. If you know these bloom filters, the operating system, uh, if you know these rows that have very low retention times, you could expose that to the operating system, and the operating system may not allocate data there. And there's another set of trade-offs there, right? Now you complicate the operating system. And I don't know if there's another trade-off, but I'll let you think about that. Oh, that would be a good exam question, perhaps. <laughs> what is the uh, upside of implementing uh, Raider in the memory controller versus DRAM, or uh, making to the operating system available what rows can store data for how long, and enabling the operating system to not allocate data to those rows that cannot retain data for a long time. Okay? But if you do this, now you can get rid of a lot of refreshes, right? That's the hardware cost. You can re reduce the refresh count by approximately 75%. Why? Well, initially all of the rows were refreshed every 64 milliseconds. Now we have two bins, some of the rows, very few of the rows are refreshed every 64 milliseconds, and uh, a little bit more, but still very few rows are refreshed every 128 milliseconds, and everything, el everything else is refreshed every 256 milliseconds. So you pretty much quadruple the refresh rate, or refresh interval, for most of the rows, actually almost all of the rows. If you uh, make the calculation, you have two to the 22 rows, right? And this is minuscule compared to 22. That's why you get 75% refresh reduction. Three-fourths of the refreshes are gone. Well, why is it not exactly 75%? Well, there are two reasons. You still need to refresh these 1,030 rows, plus you have false positives. And I believe, uh, was it in, uh, in this homework? We have uh, our homework has a problem on DRAM refresh, or no? I guess not. Our exam has a problem on DRAM refresh. I'll, uh, I'll encourage you to take a look at the uh, exam from last semester that actually lets you calculate some of these uh, refresh rates. Okay? So what does this translate to? You can read the paper, but uh, such large reductions in refresh rate leads to a large reduction in dynamic DRAM energy and also idle DRAM power. Because even, even if the DRAM is idle, even if you're not running any program, as long as your system is on, you need to keep refreshing, right? And most of the times these systems are idle, but you still need to keep refreshing the DRAM, right? Uh, and you get performance improvement because while the applications are actually running, now you're not, uh, most of the refreshes are gone. They're not contending with the application requests. And the benefits increase as DRAM scales in density. If you have a 64 gigabit DRAM chip, the benefit in energy is, energy reduction is about 50%. And performance improvement is almost 108%. Because refresh becomes the main limiter uh, to performance in such systems. Assuming you do it this way, you do it the way we do it today. Which means that we should not be doing it the way we do it today. Right? Okay, so this is one of the ideas that can enable better scaling of DRAM density as we go forward. Which is one of the major problems today that we face in memory systems. How can we get much more higher capacity systems at low energy cost? Okay, some more questions which I will not all uh, answer. What else can you do to reduce the impact of refresh? Well, if you have ideas, I'd be happy to listen. What else can you do if you know the retention times of rows? I gave you one more idea, right? Expose this to the operating system. Uh, actually, you could think of other mechanisms. For example, if you know the lifetime of objects, if you can somehow predict the lifetime of objects, perhaps using a garbage collector, you can allocate those objects based on their predicted lifetime to rows uh, that have similar retention times. Right. What's the lifetime of an object? Well, uh, if, you're, if you're programmed in object-oriented languages, uh, sometimes you destroy an object, right? You don't write to that object anymore. And that, the data, the memory that's allocated to that object is not needed after that point. Right. Which means that the data you stored in DRAM is kind of useless. You're never going to read it again before initializing. So why refresh? So that's the idea. You could, you could do something like this. And how can you accurately measure the retention time of DRAM rows? This is actually a tough problem. And I'd recommend you to take a look at uh, Jamie's recent paper on this also. Uh, so he studied uh, with Yungu, who's not here, <laughs> the data retention behavior in DRAM devices. They looked at a large number of DRAM devices, and they had an FPGA infrastructure that tests the retention time of these devices 
And they figured out that, they've actually shown that distribution actually exists and it's temperature dependent and it depends on different data patterns. And it's also hard to profile because there are some DRAM cells, it turns out, that jump between multiple retention times. So sometimes it keeps data for 64 milliseconds. Sometimes it keeps data for one second. So this shows you how unreliable circuits become as you make them smaller and smaller. The reason is mm, there's charge that gets trapped in the transistors, and that charge trapping leads to different retention times at different intervals. So reliability is something we will not cover in this course, or we'll have a much longer course. But this is another thing that you, uh, it, it, that, that would be good to be aware of going into the future. As we scale the size of these circuits, they, uh, uh, they demonstrate behavior that's not necessarily deterministic, at least in the uh, short run, right? So a cell changes between multiple retention times, 64 milliseconds to one second. That's huge, right? So if you're profiling the cell, and if you say, if you uh, look at the, if you happen to be in this interval where the cell is keeping data for one second, you'll get the wrong retention time for that cell. Too bad. That's true for a lot of the logic devices as well. They become much less reliable as we go into the future. And how to make them seem reliable is a big challenge. OK, let's take a break for uh, five minutes here, and then we'll continue with memory controllers. Hopefully, this gives you a good idea of what are the big challenges going, uh, facing us in memory systems today. And that's a great idea, except we don't have any technology that, can, that has similar characteristics to DRAM that is non-volatile. The closest we have today that's commercially successful is flash memory. And its read latencies are still on the order of hundreds uh, times larger than DRAM. So it's very hard to use it as memory. But there are some emerging technologies uh, that look promising and that have similar characteristics as DRAM. If we have time, we'll discuss that uh, toward the end of the lecture. That's another big area in memory today. Can we enable some of these emerging technologies to be part of main memory? And there are efforts going on in companies to actually incorporate some of these technologies into future products. So in earlier times, this would not be, uh, this would be like heresy because it's very hard to uh, get companies looking into an emerging technology so early on. But some of the issues we're facing in memory today are so severe that now companies are looking into, can we actually enable phase change memory or magnetic memory or memristors you may have heard of uh, as part of your main memory. So let's see if we, ha we have time to cover that. Okay. Okay. Memory controllers. So this was actually memory controllers, right? What we discussed is a big function of a memory controller to keep data intact in the UM. Uh, let me actually give this disclaimer. I guess this works well. Long latency memories have similar characteristics that need to be controlled. Refresh may not be true for all memories, uh, but the following discussion, all of the memory controller uh, discussion that we will have, we'll use DRAM as an example, but many issues are similar in the design of controllers for other types of memories. For example, flash memory, which we will not cover. It has its own characteristics, but you still need to handle scheduling, memory scheduling, interference between different applications of flash memory. Large L3 caches, I don't have it here. Other emerging memory technologies, which I just uh, briefly talked about, phase change memory, for example or spin transfer torque magnetic memory. These are some emerging memory technologies. Memristors is another one of them. Uh, these are non-volatile memory technologies with similar characteristics to DRAM. Well, a little similar latency characteristics to DRAM, but very different in other ways. Uh, have the same uh, problem. They need to be controlled somehow. So what does that controller look like? What are the functions of a DRAM controller? Well, first, it needs to ensure correct operation of DRAM in terms of refresh as well as timing. So refresh may not exist in many other memories, non-volatile memories, but timing constraints do exist. Uh, which means that when can you issue a read to memory after you do a write? Well, you need to be sure that the write is done, right? You need to be sure that the bank is available. So there's a timing constraint that says you cannot issue a write after so many cycles from the read and vice versa. And there are many such timing constraints. Uh, so, uh, so these need to be obeyed. Whilst, uh, and DRAM request needs to be serviced to do that. What are these constraints? And uh, the controller needs to keep track of resource conflicts as well, not only the timing constraints, but also the conflicts on the bus, bank, channel, 
rank, and minimum write to read delays, dot, dot, dot. It also needs to translate request to DRAM command sequences. Right? If you remember, if you want to do a read, you need to activate the row and then do a column command, read command, and then precharge. That's a command sequence for a read. And you don't always precharge. Uh, well, you don't always activate because sometimes the row is in the row buffer. So you need to figure that out. You need to buffer and schedule, the controller needs to buffer and schedule requests to improve performance. And this is where the problem becomes even harder because you have so many requests to choose from, which one do you pick? Well, depending on the availability of the row buffer, bank, rank, bus, you may want to reorder the request, right? And that reordering gives, it, it adds additional complexity to the controller. But this needs to be done if you want to get high performance. By the way, the issues are very similar in disk controllers also. Uh, you, you may see that if you take a storage systems course, but you need to do scheduling of disk requests. And the issue, uh, the scheduling is uh, uh, in a disk, in a hard disk, uh, needs to consider the characteristics of a hard disk, right? If you look at a hard disk, you have uh, the head turning around in one direction. And if you actually schedule requests that go in that direction, they're fast. If you actually uh, need some data, uh, from a, uh, from a track that the ha head just passed from, then that takes a long time because now you need to turn the head all the way to that track. So the scheduler in the disk needs to take into account similar constraints, except the constraints are a little bit different, right? It's not the banks or buses, it's the tracks and where you are, where your head is located at that point in time. And the issues are similar. If you have multiple applications going into that disk, well, which one do you schedule first? So the concepts that we'll discuss here will be very fundamental. And in fact, some of them are developed for disks, and I'll tell you when they are developed uh, so. Uh, but we'll still focus on DRAM. OK, and the third, uh, I guess, nth <laughs> task of the controller is to manage power consumption and thermals in DRAM. It can turn on or off DRAM chips and manage power modes. And this is becoming increasingly more important as systems become more energy limited, because you want to save every uh, joule that uh, you can. Okay, so several issues before we go into some of these scheduling uh, issues. We've already talked about refresh uh, a lot. We'll talk about buffering and scheduling requests and resource conflicts a little bit. Where do we place the DRAM control has been an issue. Uh, in fact, DRAM, it sits in between the processor and memory, right? And traditionally, it has been in the chipset. It has been on the platform, not on the processor, die. Uh, there are advantages to this. Like every design choice, right? This is a design choice. You give, it gives more flexibility to plug different types of DRAM into the system, right? Now you're not coupling your processor with a single type of DRAM. And even different types of memory. It doesn't have to be DRAM, right? And it gives you less power density in the CPU chip. CPU chip is already a very high power consuming chip. If you add the DRAM controller over there too, now you have a lot more activity going on. But there are advantages to uh, putting the DRAM controller on the CPU chip. And many, many multi-core processors have the DRAM controllers on the chip today. Uh, even Intel. Intel is one of the latecomers to this. Uh, they resisted moving, in, moving the DRAM controllers onto the chip for a long time, not necessarily for technical reasons. But even their controllers are on chip today. Uh, why? Because it gives you reduced latency for main memory access. Right? You don't need to go through another chip uh, to access memory. So you have the CPU chip, you have the memory controller chip, and you have DRAM. Instead of having two chips, you have CPU plus memory controller and DRAM. And this is obviously much lower latency, because communication here is high bandwidth and low latency. Well, there is also higher bandwidth between cores and the controller, which means that you can now co-optimize this design. You can put uh, design. Uh, the cores and controller together. Right. And we'll see some examples of this today. Uh, now you can communicate more information to the controller. Before you couldn't because you're pin limited, right? You'll still, you're still pin limited between DRAM and memory controller. That's a fundamental thing. But we've talked about 3D stacking, which could potentially reduce that limitation. OK. So if you look at a DRAM controller, uh, there are some request streams that share the controller. There are CPUs and I.O. requests also. The MA requests can go through here. If you have a GPU, that can go through here also. And they go into the DRAM controller, and DRAM controller arbitrates, arbitrates those requests. And you need to 
uh, do uh, command scheduling at this level. And there's some interface, uh, the signaling interface, that needs to ensure that the data integrity is maintained. Another way of looking at the DRAM controller is, this is a modern DRAM controller. Uh, you have requests coming from different L2 caches. You have some cores here that's missing the L2 caches. And these requests can go to different banks. In this case, the memory request buffer of the DRAM controller is partitioned across the banks. You have a request buffer for each bank. And you have a scheduler for each bank also. So these schedulers can operate in parallel. And then you have a DRAM bus scheduler that arbitrates between those different banks requests. So that's a more scalable design, right? Per bank request buffers, which uh, queue the requests that go to those bank, uh, go to that bank, per bank schedulers. But you have a central scheduler for the bus because this bus is shared across all banks, right? And then you have the DRAM data bus to and from the DRAM banks, and you have the address and command buses that go to the banks. And uh, this is, uh, the data gets returned uh, to the cores or come from the cores into these bank request buffers. So we'll take a look at how this memory access scheduler is designed in the next, uh, I guess, half an hour or so. So some of the scheduling policies. Uh, first come, first serve is a very simple scheduling policy, right? It's really not, no scheduling at all. You serve the request, all this request first. And you've already seen this other uh, first ready, first come, first serve scheduling policy. Uh, because row hits take much shorter, the DRAM controller prioritizes the request that hit in the row hit. So if this bank zero scheduler, when it's scheduling a request, it checks the row that's open in bank zero and prioritizes the requests that go to row zero. And assuming all else is equal, it prioritizes the older requests over the younger ones. So this is actually a prioritization order, right? For each request, you have a priority. If it's a row hit, it's higher priority than others. If it's older, then it's higher priority than others. So you can, ha you can uh, have one priority value for each request that is formed dynamically based on these status and compare the priority of all these requests. It's basically a priority encoder, right? The goal is to maximize row buffer hit rate, which maximizes DRAM throughput, which also minimizes the latency in this case, right? And actually, scheduling is done at the command level. So the way this works is column commands, read or write, are prioritized over row commands, activate or precharge. Right? And within each group, older commands are prioritized over younger ones. So there are many scheduling policies. This is essentially a prioritization order, as I said. It can be based on many things. And you could probably imagine some more things here. It could be request age, request uh, row buffer hit miss status, request type. I'd encourage you to think about how you would handle prefetch requests, for example read requests, write requests, they're not as critical for, uh, to performance of the processor, right? Uh, write requests, for example, prefetch requests. Requester type, load miss versus store miss. Again, that, that may not be uh, of the same criticality to the processor core. Because if you get a store miss, maybe you have a sector cache, right? You've written part of your sub block. You're just bringing in the rest of the data just so that you have the entire cache line in case you may have locality. But the processor is not stalled for the read miss, uh, for, for the store miss or write miss. Request criticality, all dismissed in the core. Is that the most critical request? How many instructions in the core are dependent on uh, this request? So you can imagine all of these different possibilities. If you have a multi-thread application, maybe you have one request that is to the lock. And that limits progress of many threads, because many threads are contending for that lock. If you identify that and communicate that information to the memory controller, perhaps you can get a lot better performance. So that's why incorporating uh, these two things together can enable a much better system design overall than separating them from each other. Because now you can communicate a lot more information. This core can say, oh, I'm blocking. This load request is important because I'm trying to grab a lock. And by the way, based on my tracking of the locks in the system, Previously, whenever I gathered this lock, there were many threads waiting for it. So please prioritize it, memory controller. Right? Now, if that happens, then memory controller has a lot more information. Right? It doesn't blindly do row hit first and oldest first, which may actually deprioritize that very important request and serve it, I don't know, maybe milliseconds later, right? depending on the length of your queues. That's why uh, knowing the criticality of the request somehow can enable a much better system design. And again, this is a general principle, right? I'm giving you the context of the memory controller here. But if you can somehow know 
this request is latency sensitive or critical because many other threads are waiting for it. Now you can do many things with that information, right? What can you do? You can prioritize in the cache. You can prioritize it later on in the storage subsystem. You could perhaps throttle all of the other threads that, have, that do not have those, that request, right? Maybe that's the bottleneck in your system. If you can identify that bottleneck, you can design your system around that bottleneck. Okay, let's take a look at one particular policy, robot for management policies. Uh, even though I've given you the criticality, <laughs> I'll, uh, because there are no designs that do that yet, uh, there are paper designs that uh, we have looked at and others have looked at. And if you're interested, we can go into that. But I'll give you what current systems do today, and then we'll uh, look into some more detail. So you have this row buffer. One question is, do you keep it open or do you keep it closed? That's a simple design decision, right? Open row policy means you keep the row open after an access in anticipation that some other access will actually access that row, get to, uh, go to that row, some other request. Well, that's, it's good in that case, right? If next access needs the same row, next access to that bank needs to say that, that row, you get a row hit. If next access needs a different row, then you get a row conflict. And you waste energy by keeping the row buffer open. Right? In fact, it's not only energy, but you need to pre-charge the row uh, when you get the access, which means that that access is slower now, the next access. Close the row policy, close the row after an access. So there's a dumb way of doing this, close the row after every access without looking at what's in the queue. It may be actually desirable, even though I called it dump. There are cases, uh, with, with every design decision, there's a trade-off, right? You can always find a case where that may make sense. Why? It's simple, right? If you, in fact, uh, current DRAM chips have a command uh, that can pre-charge the row right after an access. Read and pre-charge, write and pre-charge. And that's much faster, because you don't need to send a pre-charge separately. Okay. But basically, the idea is to close the row after an access. And a smarter way of doing this is do this only if no other requests are already in the request buffer that go to the same row. Now, this is good if the next access uh, is to a different row. Now you avoid a row conflict. You proactively close the row. This is bad if the next access actually needs the same row. Now you have an extra activate latency. Right? You need to open the row again. You've done the wrong thing. So these two policies, there is no best policy, actually. Uh, then the question is, can you adapt them? Predict whether or not the next access to the bank will be to the same row. And some memory controllers today do this kind of prediction based on past history of row buffer hits and misses, conflicts. They try to figure out, should I close the row or should I open, keep the row open for a while? And most memory controllers today close the row after a while uh, to save power. Because keeping the row active, actually, it's, if you look at that, Remember, the row buffer is, or if you read the papers, row buffer is a sense amplifier, right? It's basically an SRAM array. And you have the bit lines. You read one row. And these bit lines are basically, they capture, uh, I guess I can draw a cross-coupled inverter here. This is basically a cross-coupled inverter, right, that captures the value on the bit lines and bit line bar. So basically, this is an SRAM array, and you have, let's say, 8 kilobyte row buffer. Uh, you're keeping an 8 kilobyte row buffer open in each bank. And if you have many, many banks in the system, let's say 100 banks, you almost have one megabyte of memory that you're keeping active off the DRAM chip. So there's power consumption that's consumed in these sense amplifiers. So uh, you can have adaptive policies that reduce power as well. I don't know if I want to go through this. I'll let you figure this out. Basically, this is what I said exactly. If you have an open row policy versus a closed row, row policy, what happens to the first access and what happens to the next access? And what are the commands that's, that are needed for the next access? This is essentially what I said put in table form. So I'll let you study this on your own. So why are these DRAM controllers difficult to design? Uh, this is only one design decision, not one choice that the DRAM controller needs to make. And even this is complicated, right? Should I keep the row open or row closed? There are performance and energy implications. And that's one of the reasons they're a difficult design. They need to obey DRAM timing constraints for correctness. Uh, that's another reason. Right? What are those timing constraints? There are actually many, like more than 50 timing constraints in modern DRAM. One example is 
uh, write to read delays. Minimum number of cycles to wait before issuing a read command after a write command is issued. Well, why, why do you need this constraint? You need a bus to stabilize between the DRAM and the memory controller. In fact, internally within the DRAM, you need a bus to stabilize after you do a write. Because you drive these buses with, uh, 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 with the data that you're going to write, and that needs to stabilize, and that needs, that needs to be turned around. RC, TRC is a minimum number of cycles between the issuing of two consecutive activate commands to the same bank. You cannot do activate and activate until TRC is passed. And most DRAMs are evaluated based on the value of that. This is when, when people talk about the latency of a DRAM, it's usually the T rho cycle latency. That's what RC stands for. In modern DRAM, it's usually around 50 nanoseconds. And dot, dot, dot. He, uh, the controller needs to keep track of many resources, channels, banks, ranks, data bus, address bus, row buffers. Uh, and it needs to handle DRAM refresh on top of all of this. And while doing this, it needs to optimize for performance in the presence of all of these cons constraints. Reordering is basically not simple. Right? I'll let you figure out, but uh, it's basically out of order scheduling. Right? And we've covered out of order execution. This is not as critical part of the system, but it still can get many requests. And do you actually, how, uh, how do you figure out whether your prediction is a good prediction? So this paper lists some of the timing constraints here. Uh, you can look at some of these. So there's a timing constraint between read to precharge, for example. Write recovery. Uh, there's a timing constraint that says four activate windows. For example, you can do only four activates within, uh, you can do at most four activates within 24 DRAM cycles. Can anybody guess why that timing constraint is there? You, you cannot do more than four, you cannot issue more than four activates uh, within that time window, 24 DRAM cycles. I'll show you this and you'll tell me power, right? <laughs> Basically power, because the power, uh, DRAM chips are designed with some power supply, uh, uh, but some amount of power they can draw and they will become unreliable if you actually send another activate over there. So there are many constraints here. In fact, uh, you don't really need to have all of these constraints, right? There, there's a reason why these constraints are there. Uh, and that reason is really performance. So you could have a single constraint saying, you cannot issue a DRAM command after n cycles, right? I don't care which bank it goes to. I don't care what command it is. I'm going to choose this n as the worst case that covers all of these latencies. Now your controller is very, very simple to design, right? It just issues a command every n cycles. But that's, that's not fun, right? <laughs> that's exactly why we have these DRAM timing constraints. And that's the reason why these are fundamental, right? Whenever you have banked memories uh, with writes and reads, you'll have these timing constraints. You cannot get rid of these. You can come out with any kind of memory uh, and I'll come up with the timing constraints for that memory. So flash memory, for example, has similar timing constraints that are different, of course. You don't perhaps for, have four activate windows, but you have something else. Okay? So actually, if you're interested in uh, DRAM operation more, I'd encourage you to look at one of Jungu's papers uh, and one of the other papers here that, actually, that give you the timing constraints, but they're not required. Actually, if you, if you look at this, uh, this is the activation. This is the row cycle timing constraint. This is, you can issue an activate here. And after some time, you can read the array. You can issue a read command. There's a timing constraint, TRCD. Why, why is there a timing constraint there? Basically, this is a timing constraint to activate the row. Now the data that comes from the bit lines are stabilized in the row buffer. Now you can do a read. And after some point, you can do the pre-charge. And after some point, you can do the next activate. Next activate can happen only the, after the bank is pre-charged. Right? That's why you have this T row cycle constraint. And if you look at the value of it, if I can find it, it's 52.5 nanoseconds in DDR3-1066. But you will have similar constraints in other memories as well. OK. So I think I'll probably end with this slide unless I have another thing. OK. Another thing that DRAM chips today, uh, DRAM controllers need to do today is DRAM power management. If you look at DRAM chips, they have these power modes. Uh, 
And you can use these power modes to minimize energy consumption. And many controllers do this. The idea is when you're not accessing a chip, power it down. Uh, there are some power states. These are some examples. Active is the highest power. Basically, you can access the chip at any time. And you can have all banks idle, meaning no row buffers are open. And you can have a power down state. And you can have a self-refresh state. The exact definitions you can read. But basically, suffice it to say that you have some power modes. I guess you can say this is the high power active. And self-refresh means the DRAM is just refreshing itself. You cannot issue any command. This is the mode uh, uh, which, in which your cell phone probably operates in the most, of, most of the time. Because most of the time, you're not using this, right? It's just doing self-refresh. It's going into this mode where most of the DRAM peripheral circuitry is turned off, except a little bit of circuitry in DRAM that just does refreshes. And that circuitry is minimized to maximize power uh, efficiency. So, why not always keep the system in self-refresh, except when you get a request? Well, the difficulty is powering up all of that circuitry takes time. Right? Basically, there's latency associated with getting out of these power modes. You can do accesses only here. This is where you can do read or write accesses, or, uh, or I should say accesses. And there's a significant latency going out of the power mode uh, into uh, this high power mode, which is the active mode. So state transitions basically incur latency. And figuring out when to put a DRAM chip into the self-refresh mode is a tough task. Now you need to predict whether you're going to have an access to this DRAM chip, right? And I don't remember what the state transition is, but this is on the order of microseconds. And this could impact your quality of service, right, if you're in your self-refresh mode. So you could imagine designing prediction mechanisms that predict when you're not going to access a particular DRAM and when, when you are going to access it. And you could tie it to the user's behavior as well. Right? In fact, many operating systems today uh, do things like prefetching. For example, they can keep track of your behavior. If you are using your email at 9 AM in the morning, they can prefetch your emails for you. There are operating systems that do that. Windows is one example. Uh, and they, do, they use some machine learning techniques to figure that out. You could use something similar in the DRAM controller. In fact, the operating system could potentially do some of this. Existing DRAM controllers are not as sophisticated. They use simple counters, of course. If you, if you want to implement this in hardware, it may be difficult to uh, come up with a sophisticated policy. But that's the idea. There are trade-offs associated with the power states. And DRAM controllers need to manage these power states, too, if you want to maximize power efficiency. OK, any questions? OK, I think I'll stop here. And we'll, uh, we'll start with this topic uh, on Wednesday.